Hey everybody, welcome back to part two in a multi-part episode that's exploring the new release of the horror movie The Lazarus Effect. That's a film of a group of scientists who develop a serum that can bring the dead back to life. Sort of. If you want to hear my review of that film, then you can check out part one. But in this second part, I'm going to be digging deeper into one of the key subjects or topics of the film. And that is the supposed phenomenon of NDEs, or more commonly known as near-death experiences. There are human beings here, in this hallowed ground. Their earthly bodies, long since, turned to dust. But what about their souls, their minds? Are they here too? You are about to see one of the most extraordinary films of our time. A movie that dares to investigate the possibility of life after death. Everything you will see is based on the scientific studies of parapsychologists and doctors as well as on the testimony of real people who were pronounced dead, yet miraculously recovered, and lived to tell of their incredible journey. Sun Classic Pictures put out Beyond and Back in 1978 because they wanted to plug into the growing public interest in near-death experiences. One of the key figures in bringing NDEs to the public consciousness was a man called Raymond A. Moody Jr. He wrote a book called Life After Life in 1975, and that book uh, is where we first hear the phrase near-death experiences. And Moody and others like him were discovering a surprisingly regular pattern emerging where numbers of people who'd been very close to death, or indeed those who had been clinically dead for a short time, were reporting of having some sort of strange experience or vision during that time. And once um, Moody's book came out, citing a number of cases, many more people started to be interested and started looking into this phenomenon. Now that's not to say that NDEs only started in the mid-1970s, of course. There were older and other reports of people who claimed to have such visions. For example, in 1944, the eminent psychiatrist Carl Jung had a heart attack, and it led to something that amazed him. In his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he claims to have found himself uh, when he had this heart attack, surrounded by light, and then he was whisked up to a position where he could view the earth from above it of about a thousand miles. And then he went to describe how his top-down view of the earth with spooky accuracy, considering that astronauts wouldn't physically view such an angle for another two decades. And he also spotted a huge meteorite floating next to him, which turned out to have connections with the Hindu temple of the Holy Tooth in Kandy in Ceylon. Now, it's a pretty intense experience by all accounts. But what's interesting is that Jung, who was, of course, an expert in the human brain and the powers of psychology, he insisted that this experience was both eternal and was real. Now there's hordes of other people who've made similar claims that they've said that they've had some sort of vision of the afterlife. And while there are variations between accounts, there's plenty of variations, many of them have very similar characteristics. There's the sense of peace and leaving the body maybe alongside a buzzing sound or a ringing. There's often an out of body experience moment where someone rises up and views their own body as doctors and nurses work over them. You know, the classic sort of idea. And then what tends to happen is that the person is drawn down a tunnel of light and at the end of it they meet relatives and friends long dead. And sometimes they even meet spiritual beings, I guess they might be angels or something. Now they might even have that sense of their life flashing before them which usually apparently happens very quickly. I guess it's like a showcase of all the most significant bits of your life and it makes one wonder what the highlights of your own life would be if it were ever to happen to you. But while this new experience is often peaceful and awe-inspiring, the subject of NDEs usually get told in some ways that it's not quite the right time for them to leave life itself and they return to their bodies. For Carl Jung, he said that he was there in the image of, the doc of his doctor floated up from the direction of Europe, a thousand miles below him, and the doctor was now in what Jung calls his primal form. 
and that he the doctor he'd known on earth had just been an avatar for this pure essence of him and anyway without speaking the pure essence of this doctor communicates with him and says young it's not, not your time to get and you need to come back and, and, he, and he does and, and the experience was over now bear in mind that there's a lot of people who've had this similar experience in fact According to Chambers' Dictionary of the Unexplained, in 1992, a poll was organized by Gallup who said that nearly 8 million Americans claimed they'd had an NDE. And in 2001, a report in The Lancet said that of the 344 patients in the test who'd been brought in the study, who'd been brought back after a heart attack, 18% of them had experienced an NDE in more or less the classic form. So what's going on here? Well, many people just see it as straightforward absolute proof of the afterlife. If you just type in near-death experiences into the internet, you will get blogs and books and videos from people claiming to not only have an NDE, but of claiming their experience is the final proof we need of the existence of the divine and eternal life. For example, one video I saw claimed Jesus appeared to a Christian and a Muslim who had a near-death experience, both of them, and they the person concluded, therefore, that this is cast iron proof that Jesus therefore exists and is alive today because he appeared to these people in a near-death experience. Indeed, there's a recent book by Eben Alexander, MD, that was subtitled A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife, but the main title is Proof of Heaven. In fact, I've met people who have claimed to have had some sort of first-hand experience of the afterlife themselves. Literally, just the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking in a church and one of the congregation was chatting to me afterwards over a cup of tea and we happened to get talking about the afterlife, as you do, and he said, oh, I've seen it. And I was like, pardon? And he described something that he said wasn't heaven or hell, but it was some realm between heaven and earth, which was he was convinced was an actual place that he saw. Now, the reports from people like Carl Jung and others are certainly intriguing, but for some people, they are absolutely not proof of the afterlife. Even some Christians and theologians question the idea of NDEs, claiming that once people die, they don't come back, so they couldn't really report on it. These critics don't deny the idea of the afterlife, but they don't believe people can visit the afterlife and then pop back to the normal world for a chat. So they dismiss NDEs on what you might call biblical or even theological grounds. Others prefer to give a much less epic but still fascinating explanation. They argue that NDEs are simply hallucinations which come about from the intense chemical processes that the brain goes through and experiences when it's faced with its coming extinction. In other words, your, your sturdy, reliable brain and a last ditch attempt to help you cope with the depth of, of what you're experiencing, i.e. death, pumps out an intense psychedelic trip that helps reduce the physical and emotional pain of your own death. This is where the topic of dimethyltryptamine or DMT comes in, which I mentioned in the last episode. It's sort of like a final dream blast of the brain before it dies. Which is it? Well, I'm not sure. But to be honest with you, I think the hallucination theory seems quite sensible, especially because so many people seem to have, have context appropriate experiences. For example, the Christian near-death experience is often filled with Christian imagery, and I've not heard of any sort of born-again Christians who've had an NDE like Carl Jung did, you know, wandering through a Hindu temple perched on a meteorite a thousand feet above the earth. So to be honest, I am I'm a bit skeptical when I hear of books and films and things like that, which where people claim, I have seen what is beyond death, I have visited heaven, I have seen hell. However, I'm not prepared to rule out that there's nothing to this, particularly because I think it's reasonable to hope that there may well actually be an afterlife. Which is one of the reasons why I believe in God, by the way, because I'm not ready to shut down the idea that life is purely flesh and blood and that alone. Now, gathering actual proof of near-death experiences is one of those things that I think is very, very elusive and even if we were to experience one ourselves, I don't think we can rule out the DMT theory unless we can organize some sort of specific test that can object be objectively assessed. Like the classic idea for this is that in hospitals, for example, there should be a series of numbers or a special message placed on the top of cupboards or high up in the emergency room so that anyone who happens to have an NDE can make a quick note of the code and then announce it to the doctors later when they come back. Um, now, there is a good logical intention to that approach, 
but it seems rather ambitious to me to expect someone who is literally having the mind-bending experience of witnessing their own death from outside their own body to have the wherewithal to mentally jot down a series of numbers. However, while there isn't any lab condition tests that have, I, I have heard being done to like evaluate the validity of an NDE, it's quite intriguing to hear eyewitness accounts from doctors and nurses who have said they've seen strange things in the operating theater. Earlier, I trawled through the YouTube videos that included the term near-death experience, and there is a lot of them. And I tried to avoid anything that seemed to be from a religious perspective or was trying to make a claim that NDEs proved one particular worldview. I wanted to basically find something a bit more neutral. And I found a video on a dentistry channel where a famous cardiac surgeon's being interviewed about, about his experiences of strange events in the operating room. And he tells the story of a man who was clinically dead yet returned um, half an hour later or something and gave details of the room that he couldn't possibly have known apparently. And what I liked about this video was that it didn't appear at least to be pushing one particular religious view. It was just saying, we're professionals, this happened and yes, it's weird. And perhaps it opens the door to the possibility of there being some sort of spirit world, which to me, I think is fascinating and of course, quite an exciting prospect. Now, if you were to ask me, do I want NDEs to be true? Then my answer is, well, I want life after death to be true. And I think it's reasonable to think it may well be true. Um, so that image of floating above the earth like Carl Jung and feeling that sense of moving to some superior realm is, in my opinion, a thoroughly attractive prospect in the face of death. And like I say, while I'm skeptical about many of the cases I hear about, I'm still not ready to rule every single one of them out. I guess I can find comfort, if that's the right word, that at some point I'm going to experience it myself. After all, it's guaranteed that every single one of us are going to have a near-death experience. The only rare thing is that most of us won't return to report it. If NDEs are nothing more but a blast of DMT happy time just before your body flicks the final switch, then I guess I'm going to die potentially with a smile on my face in some ways. But if they really are a doorway into another realm, then I'll be the guy climbing onto that massive meteorite hanging in space, and I'm going to ride that sucker all the way to heaven. Well, that's it for the flicks the church forgot. Thank you for uh, listening. And remember, if you're up for it, I'd appreciate if you could subscribe below and follow me on Twitter, where I go by the name of at Rev Peter Laws. Oh, and you can also read my monthly horror column in the print magazine, The Fortean Times. But until then, thank you so much for listening or watching. And um, while I don't expect this show to feature on the final showreel of your life, for now at least, don't forget the flicks the church forgot.